this evening, I want to talk about theft, like like people stealing from you. And the biggest thief is who I want to address tonight. And that thief is the devil. The Bible tells us he's a thief. We know from John 10.10, 10, the thief cometh not but for to do what? To steal and to destroy. Depending on which version you are reading. But Jesus said, I've come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. We try to secure our properties so that people don't come and steal our sweat. A lot of us have security system, alarm systems, cameras all over the place. In fact, I just discovered a camera that doesn't require monthly monitoring and paying. You just get a camera, very tiny, and put it anywhere in your house, your garage, outside, and it records the same. You monitor it from your phone. No further obligations after you get it, which looks like a good deal. So we have cameras. We have things that uh, we are securing and we try to protect our property. Sometimes in our lives, we have issues. There are people that sometimes are torn in our flesh. And you may go to your job, some of us, we are struggling. Even though we are doing the best we are supposed to do in our job, but because there's an invisible enemy behind the boss you have, or behind your co-workers, or behind something somewhere, somebody on your job, that the enemy has just put in there to attack you, or to make life so difficult for you. There are people that are bullies. They try to bully us. They try to intimidate us. And sometimes, especially when they know we are Christians, that spirit will get on them. They say, are you a Christian? I remember a guy I engaged to do some roofing job. He didn't do his job. I had already paid him 75% of the work. He came preaching to me. He said, especially a preacher. I said, stop it right there. You're, you're not in a position to preach to me because you're the one messing up to begin with. I've given you grace. A job that was supposed to take four weeks, I've given you grace almost more, more than eight weeks. I said, stop it right there. Don't preach to me. Because they're going to think, okay, you're going to take it lying down because, you know, they abuse, abuse you and try to abuse the relationship. No, we shouldn't take it. And there are some of us, you are seeking things in your life, you're doing things, you've done everything you know how to do. But every time you come close to victory, it just, boom, slips out of your hand. Every time. You've done, you've tried. There was nothing you haven't done. But when you come very close to gaining victory, it seems like that victory slips away from you. And the question is, what are we going to do? You know, the word of God says this. For we are not ignorant of the devices of the devil. We are not ignorant of the devices of the devil. And it also warns us that we should not allow the devil to take advantage of us. That's actually... They turn from that scripture. It says, let Satan take advantage of you. Let Satan take advantage of you, for we are not God, ignorant of the devices of the enemy. I think it's in 2 Corinthians 2.11, if I'm not mistaken. I haven't checked it out lately because it's one of those things I memorized years ago. Let Satan do what? Take advantage this is the word of God giving us warning ahead of time, knowing the kind of adversary we are facing. We gotta be prepared. We gotta be knowledgeable about the adversary. 
we got to equip ourselves so that it doesn't take advantage of us. How do we do that? In business. Let's say you have a contract with somebody. You have to read the contract. You have to know the parameters of the contract. When the person starts going, violating the contract, you know, you say, hey, buddy, this is not what the contract says. And this is what the contract says. So you don't let them take advantage of you. Why? Because the contract is definitive. That is the same thing. We have a contract with God. It's called covenant relationship. But we have an opposition. Where the Bible tells us his job description is to steal, is to destroy, is to turn around everything that God meant for us to be good, to turn it to become evil. So what do we do in situations like this? Because over and over and over and over, we see it. Maybe our children is taking them in the wrong direction. Maybe our relationship is going south. Maybe the marriage is breaking. Maybe the promises you know that God has given you, they are not working the way. There's an opposition. These promises are not automatic. They were not. You read the book of Daniel. When Daniel prayed, was expecting to get a response from God. When the messenger came, he was hindered. For 21 days, Daniel could not get it. He got a breakthrough later, after all. So because it was there, and Daniel was it for the having, for reading, it still didn't manifest immediately until Daniel pushed through. I read a story, and I'm going to give you a couple of stories here that will help us. Because I'm all over the place in terms of the time, the Bible, the passages there. You know all the verses. It doesn't pay to know the Bible and we don't apply it. It doesn't pay. It doesn't do us any good. It doesn't do us. I read a story of a grandma. Grandma was 80 years old in New York. And grandma, every weekend, a couple of guys, sometimes it's one guy, Sometimes it's uh, more than one guy. They will come to grandma and they will break into grandma's house and rob grandma and take away. They, they've been do doing this to grandma for almost six months. If I remember that story correctly, it's been a long time I read it. So you know what? Grandma decided he was going to do something. <laughs> I remember a comedian. A comedian says that uh, his brother was harassed by thieves, arm robbers every time. And his brother decided he had had enough. He was going to take action. He was going to teach the arm robbers. He was going to teach them a lesson. And then we were waiting to see what his brother did. If the brother really stood up to the arm robber, he said he moved, he relocated. That was the lesson he taught them. <laughs> he, he moved from where he was living. That's not what we are talking about right now. I'm talking about confrontation. I'm talking about being supernaturally equipped to confront the adversary because God has given us the tools. What did grandmother do? Grandma went to a, ne a nearby gym and enrolled. Grandma, 80 years old, began to push, lift weight. Nobody... Nobody knew the secret behind this grandma's action. She began to learn how to move. She lifted weights. She began to, all of a sudden, within a couple of months, grandma has become very strong, developed strong muscles, and even won the competition of the oldest, uh, strongest <laughs> woman or man in that gym. Grandma became transformed. Because grandma had gotten into training. That training had transformed grandma's life. So what did grandma do? So grandma had a secret plan. The thief or the bully did not know. So on that eventful weekend, grandma was sleeping. And the thief came as usual. 
grandma hid behind the door. The thief came, grandma gave the thief a left hook. I'm talking about, I'm talking about a young man in about his 40s. Grandma decked the thief with a left hook and stood on that thief until police came. The police came, they looked, they said, ah, you mean this woman held you no gun? And the thief said, <laughs> when grandma decked him, <laughs> he had concussion. <laughs> he had concussion. He said he's never seen anybody hit him like that before. 80 years old, <laughs> he was arrested. That's what I'm talking about today. That's what I'm, the devil has messed us up enough and we have to draw the line. You have to make up your mind like grandma. God has already warned us and said we are not ignorant lest he take advantage. He's been taking advantage of so many. For years, he's been lying to us. Oh, this sickness, you're not going to be healed because it's not the will of God. Oh, God heals some God, doesn't he? It's not for us to determine who God heals and who God doesn't heal. It's for us to believe for ourselves that God is going to heal us because that's what he, he says to us. The outcome is to, up to God now, not to you. Not to you to go out and determine. This person is going to be saved. This person is not going to be saved. We're going to believe. How do you know if you're going to be saved if you accept Christ or you don't accept Christ? They use that, uh, that doctrine to scare people away from coming to Christ. Oh, God already has made up his mind. Who is going to be a Christian? Who is not going to be? So there's no point. So if this person doesn't get saved, don't worry. That's not from the devil. That's a scheme. I mean, not from God. It's a scheme of the enemy. They could have said the apostle Paul, who said that uh, he uh, fought against the church and blasphemed the Holy Spirit in ignorance. Nobody, it, it could have been written off as somebody who would never be saved because he blasphemed the Holy Spirit. But they did it ignorantly. So these kinds of lies that the enemy is putting, the devices, oh, once saved, always saved, so you can go on and just live a sinful life and you're still saved. There are all kinds. Oh, yeah, my child was born this way. Uh, he's homosexual, you know. That's how it's in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. The only way is in, if it's in the Bible, in Romans, God talked about you using men and women and women to women and, and abomination. Oh, that is just the way God made us. Now, don't get me wrong. I am not one that believe we need to call people names to get them saved. I don't believe that. I don't believe you should carry a plan like, oh, homosexuals will go to hell. When you alienate them, how are you going to minister to them? I just don't believe that. That's not my style. Maybe you've done it and it worked for you. There was a time those things used to work for me, but I was immature. And half of the time, it didn't work for me. I don't believe in calling names. Jesus did not come to shame sinners. He came to seek and to save those which were lost. He didn't come to shame sinners. So we shouldn't be throwing stones. We should be telling them that Jesus loves you and he doesn't want you to go to hell. He paid with his life so you can come to know Christ, not to shame them. If you show me in the Bible where it says, I've come that I may shame sinners, show it to me. Even the apostles one time said, Jesus was disrespected in one particular journey. And the apostles said, shall we call fire from heaven? Master, for the way they disrespected you, what did Jesus say? Jesus said, you guys are fools. I did not come to destroy men's lives. I've come to save. So I'm not one who believe that people, transgender, just hit them on the head, cuss them out, and then they're going to be saved. That's not the Bible. It's not scriptural. It's not. It's not. You and I, we, we read it. We saw a woman who was about to be stoned, and she did the wrong thing. She was in an adulterous relationship. And before Jesus' time, even before he died, people were stoned for things like that. What did Jesus do? Jesus took the woman in and began to write. 
And everybody that was accusing that man disappeared. Jesus said, who condemns you? He said, Lord, no man condemns you. Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. That is the love of God. That is the compassion of God. He didn't come to shame people so we can. Those are the ignorant of the devices. Those are the devices of the enemy. So that we aggravate people, they become angry. If you preach the gospel to them and they become angry, so be it. That's a different story. But if you're calling them name and, you know, just uh, abusing them and, and then you want them to listen to the gospel, they're not going to do that. They're going to do it. You saw the story of the woman. The woman at the well. She was notorious. Nobody wanted anything to do with her. She couldn't fetch water in the well in, in the city because nobody wanted her around because of her reputation. And she went far away to fetch water. Far away. How do I know? The Bible says that Jesus must needs go through Samaria. That tells us that it wasn't his intention to go there. Samaria was way out of the way from where he was going. But he saw the crying soul of this woman. He saw a woman who was rejected. He saw a woman who had nothing, who was crying out for help, crying out for mercy. And Jesus went to that woman, went out of his way to meet that woman. And you know the end of the story? And the entire community came to know Christ because of that. So those are the, some of the things the enemy would do, that good things, but we have the right attitude, the wrong attitude, and we try to earn it. But what I want you to do, though, is to see some of these stories I'm going to tell you tonight. There's a pastor in New York, a Nigerian pastor. He was in a motorcycle accident. As he got into a motorcycle accident, the church gathered. They were going to amputate him, cut his leg or one of his legs off. That was the only way to save his life by medical assessment. I mean, that was nothing anybody could do in the national. Brethren gathered, they called around, people joined, began to speak the word of God, began to look into the covenant relationship, began to remind God of his healing power, refused and rejected the report of the doctor, they didn't cause the doctor or call him an infidel or anything. No, they thanked him, but they refused to take it. Why? Because of the higher report. That's, we have a covenant with God. That's part of what I'm telling you now. Because of the higher report, he is the Lord, our healer. You see, you got to learn the word of God, put it in your spirit. It becomes a reservoir because one day you're going to need it. If you don't spend time knowing what the master has proclaimed for your situation, when that situation hits, the adversary will turn it the other direction and try to destroy you and steal from you and lie to you. Thank God that that church, the pastor has been teaching them the healing power of God, that with God all things are possible. Even when, when, when the devil... The enemy says, no, it's not going to happen. God says, yeah, trust me. And they began to trust God. They began to rebuke that spirit that says there's no healing except amputating his foot. In and out. Make the last decision. The doctors, they will put pressure on you because they want to move you on so another patient can come in. In and out, back and forth. The pastor refused, the wife refused, the brethren refused. They kept, you're not going to amputate him. Began to pray, began to call the promises of God. Began to look at the promises of God. Began to remind the enemy that is completely defeated by Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And that the healing power of God was still and still was and is still operating in us. Because the Bible says, for this purpose, Jesus Christ was manifested. He would destroy the works of the devil. One of the works of the devil is sickness. 
They stood. They refused. They resisted the enemy. Submit, James 4, 7. Submit yourself to the Lord and then do what? Resist the devil. They resisted. And they resisted. And they resisted. And they resisted. So the pastor went to sleep in the hospital. While the pastor was sleeping, he had a dream. In that dream was an angel of God had a, a big bucket full of legs, different sizes. That angel brought that uh, uh, bucket full of legs and began to feed the brother in the vision. And it was trying to fit. It will, the angel will fit, and this was not the size. It will put it in the other bucket. It will fit this one. It wasn't the size. It will put it in the other bucket. It will fit this one. It wasn't the size. It will put it onto the last one. When he put the last one, the last one was the right size. And the brother woke up, and his leg was completely healed by the power of God. Somebody shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. That is what I'm talking about. A lot of us have taken a beating so much that we don't even know what victory is, even if God gives us one. We've been in the dungeon for a long time. We've been in the darkness for a long time. It's lied to us for a long time. We go to our job, we get beaten up, and all of that. I want you to know tonight, unless you want to allow it to happen, I'm not encouraging you to fight anybody, but I'm telling you, we can fight it with the word of God, not with carnal weapons, because our weapons are not carnal. They are mighty through God to pulling down strongholds. You have to make up your mind. You got to resist. If that brother had not resisted, if that church had not resisted, if the wife had not resisted, the leg would have been amputated. But they stood looking in the word of God because the devil is defeated. When you have a message for the devil tonight, write it under your feet and show it and say the devil is defeated and Jesus Christ is enthroned and we have victory. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. I want to remind you tonight that the devil is defeated. I'm going to tell you another story, then I'll read the word of God and show you something. We used to live, uh, we moved a lot. So we used to live in Charlotte, North Carolina. I met a lady at that time and uh, we sat she told me her story and then she told the story to the church and he said why not story her name was Betty Baxter Betty was a young woman when the parents had Betty Betty was crippled she was born that way she was born crippled she couldn't go to school she couldn't do anything. There was nothing Betty could do. Nothing. Betty was called the cripple of the neighborhood in, in Minnesota. So the mother began to teach her the Bible. Betty began to devour the scriptures. She couldn't go to school, but she could read the Bible and devour the, the scriptures. And Betty saw where Jesus was healing. She saw where the Bible said Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And she realized that it was the devil that had stolen her health. She was 12 years old. You know how people in the community went around saying, well, you know, you guys are Christians. You're Christians. How, how can they say that they must have done something bad to their God? That's why God gave them a crippled baby. The baby could not wear a dress. They could only cover this baby with, uh, with a cloth, with draperies. The baby had now grown up to be 12 years. She couldn't do anything, but she read the Bible. She saw where Jesus healed in the Bible. She began to just read it. Defied every odds. Defied the doctors. Defied the, the father. Betty was consistently reading the word. One day, Betty said to Mama, Mama, Jesus. Worlds from you come from. They come from your desires for pleasure. Which what is that? 
What is that? Somebody please mute. Mute. Bet, bet, Betty said, Mama, Jesus appeared to me. Jesus said he's coming to our house. Sister Muta, Sister Muta, mute. Mute, mute. Your thing is going crazy. Jesus has come to our house. And Jesus said he's going to come, I think, August, either 15 or 13, one of those days. I don't remember, but it doesn't matter. And Jesus said he will come at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. He's going to heal me. You know, conventional wisdom will say, no, that's not God. Because she must have, you know, heard from revelation, it can't be God. God heals instantly. God is that and that. But that's not true all the time. There are gradual healing. There are instant healings. Instant healings are more than gradual healings, but they do happen. So the mother believed the daughter. The mother believed the daughter. The daughter said, Mama, go to the store. Buy me a blue dress. Buy me a pair of black shoes. August the 15th at 3 o'clock, I'm going to wear it because Jesus is coming to our house. Betty had a little brother who went around the schoolyard inviting everybody to their house on the 15th of August. Betty's father was not convinced because Betty's father went to the doctor, reported the mother for believing that Betty said Jesus was coming. The doctor said Betty was losing her mind. And when she dies, then we're going to get help for the mother. We're going to get psychiatric help for the mother. Betty was adamant. Mama, hang the dress so I'll be looking at this dress. August the 15th, I'm going to go into this dress. The father, at the meantime, picked Betty up and said, Betty, daddy loves you so much. If you die and go see Jesus, please tell Jesus that daddy had done everything he could for your recovery, and I was not. And put Betty down. So the news spread. August the 15th, the place was packed. The room was packed. It was a standing room only. Because they had already broadcast this thing all over the place. Betty's pastor said, Mrs. Baxter, I won't be in town August the 15th. I'll be out of town. He skipped town. He was embarrassed for Betty's mother saying that thing. But they stood, they stood their ground. They stood their ground. August 15 came, three o'clock in the afternoon, the house began to shake. Betty said, Jesus is here. Jesus is here. Jesus touched Betty Baxter. Betty Baxter was completely healed by the power of God. Betty Baxter became an international evangelist. I believe she's still alive. She must be in her 80s now. She worked with all the robbers for many years. So what am I telling you? Is the report of the enemy? Is the attack of the enemy? Is the way he camouflages things and makes you think that the arm of God cannot reach you? It's your destiny to get up and fall and get up and keep falling. Makes you believe that this is normal. The life is normal. It's normal just to go to work and have my co-workers take over my life mess me up and it just you know it's just that's just the way it's supposed to be you have to endure it no no it's a thief it's a thief because the bible says god has given has op have, has an open door for you and no man can shut that door why will the enemy take your promotion why will he take your job why will he shut it unless god is going to give you another one you got to be tired and sick of getting tired of losing things that you know are the will of God for you, of living in situations you know are not the will of God for you, of getting moved around and bullying on your job when you know it's not God's will for you, of the enemy trying to siphon your children and take them to hell when you know it's not the will of God. Somebody has to do something. I have a conviction that the devil is on the loose. But I have a greater conviction that he is defeated. The story I'm going to share with you now is from the Bible. 
is 2 Samuel chapter 13, chapter 23, verse 11. Sister Terry, are you there? I'm going to make it short. Yes. 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 11. Will the men of Keilah deliver me up into his hand? That's Will not, Saul come? That's not right. Second, oh, that's second. That's second. I'm sorry, that was first Samuel. Okay. Did you eat pork chitlin tonight? That is no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> second Samuel 23, 11. And after him was Shammah, the son of Agi, the Hararite. Yeah. And the Philistines were gathered together into a troop where was a piece of ground full of lentils and the people fled from the Philistines. Okay, go on, go on. But he stood in the midst of the ground and defended it and slew the Philistines and the Lord wrought a great victory. Hallelujah. And three... Okay. Yeah, that's okay. That's why I want us to stop. You see, this man, I... I don't know why the Bible just put him in that little. I did research. I realized that he was one of David's mighty men. You see, the Philistines had been a thorn in the flesh of the Israelites. They had been. They were stealing from the Israelites. They were bullies. They were intimidating them. The Israelites would plant the crops. They would put their sweat. They would till the ground. They would chase away who the wheat. But at harvest time, who take the harvest? The Philistines will come and take the harvest. And the Israelites will run. Every harvest time. The same story. You do your work. You do everything. You plant. You cultivate. When it's time to eat, the fruit of your labor goes. The enemy comes and steals. But you know what? Like the grandma, the 80-year-old grandma, Shama, had a secret plan this time. I believe that Shama was saying to himself as he was planting the crops, lentils is uh, like a pea, pea patch. You guys know what lentil is. As he was planting, he was speaking to himself. You know, he was probably saying to himself, this harvest time, I'm not going to run. This harvest time, no, no more. Enough is enough. The devil has done enough. The Philistines said, I'm not going to have the enemy eat the fruit of my harvest. I will never. I will, it will never happen again. I believe that he was planting, he was encouraging himself and doing it. I'm saying, I'm not going to have the, my babies go hungry when the enemy will come and then we will all run my, while their babies are getting fat on the fruit of my level. It will never happen again. He remembered his covenant with God. He remembered he was a covenant guy. He remembered the power guy. You see, Shammah, being a part, former part of David's mighty men, he already saw David and observed how David had victory. You see, we talk about David and Goliath, which we're going to read uh, some of the verses here tonight before we close. And many a time we don't dig deep and see actually what David said. Shama had studied David and realized that was a path to victory. You know what happened? The Philistines, just like the thief to the grandma in New York, they got out together again. They got out together. Sister Terry, read it again one more time, please. Read it one more time. I want everybody. And after him was Shama, the son of Agi, the Hararite. And the Philistines were gathered together into a troop where was a piece of ground full of lentils, and the people fled from the Philistines. But he stood in the midst of the ground and defended it and slew the Philistines, and the Lord wrought a great victory. Hallelujah. <laughs> Just as before, the people fled. Do you, do you realize in Christianity that majority is not always right? You saw the majority report? It was the minority report that was right. Majority is not, you know what? Majority of the people are not paid. They don't pay tight. Majority of the people don't pay tight. They don't give offering tight above 
and they struggled financially and they wonder why. Majority is not always right. The Philistines came as before. The Bible said, and the people fled. And the people fled. They were terrified again. They were allowing the enemy to come and eat the harvest, the fruit of their labor. But there was one man, his name was Shammah, who understood what it meant to stand with God, who understood mm -hmm. what the Bible says about the power of God, who understood the promises of God, who understood that the devil was defeated and the enemy could not conquer. Only one man. There were thousands of Philistines. The Bible says Shammah stood his ground. He stood his ground, defended it. He stood his ground, defended it. And what happened? The Lord wrote a great victory. The Lord wrote a great victory. Why? If Shammah had taken off and run, the Lord would not have run a great victory because so many other people ran. One man defeated an entire army. Why? Because he stood. I was looking at the word of God in 1 John 4.4. 4. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. In Colossians 2.15, he spoiled principalities and powers. He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. James 4, 7 says, resist the devil and then submit yourself and resist the devil and he will do what? He will flee from you. But 1 John 3, 8, for this purpose, Jesus Christ was made manifest that he will do what? Destroy the works of the devil. God has translated us into his dear kingdom and he has disarmed the enemy. We have dominion. First Peter 5, 8. What does he say? We need to resist him because the enemy comes like what a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Yeah, and he says, him whom resist steadfast. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The mm -hmm. warfare we have is in Ephesians 6. You know that. We're going to look at some of it. But this young man refused to run away. Betty Baxter refused to yield to the enemy's report about her health, that she was condemned to that kind of lifestyle. She did. Grandma refused and trained. We need to do that. We need to take the weapons of our office. Take the word of God. Put it in your spirit. Have a reservoir so that when you need it, it's going to show up. Revelation 12, 11, we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Shama stood his grounds. Tonight you can run or you can stand. You keep running and running from things and things are just chaotic, upside down, sideways. It's not supposed to be. Yeah, those challenges in life would come. We're not supposed to be problem free. But what I'm telling you now is what works. We, we are looking at it. It's working. It's working when you take a stand with God. Not a physical stand, because it's a spiritual warfare. You cannot defend it. Shama stood his grounds. Shama stood his grounds, and the Bible says, and the Lord. It wasn't the will of God. That, that will show you. It wasn't the will of God for you to sweat and somebody will eat your harvest. It's not. It's in Isaiah, I think, 64 or so, 62. The enemy shall not eat your harvest. Why didn't, why didn't God show up all the other time? Because the people were running away. They were afraid. They allowed fear to overcome them. That's why. God didn't show up. God was always there. They ran away. God couldn't have said, okay, since you guys are running away, they, they just forgot the power of God. They just forgot the covenant. They just forgot the promises of God. If Shammah had run with the people, we wouldn't have this story recorded in a small place in the Bible. Shammah stood his ground, defended it, defended it, defended it, and the Lord showed up big time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just show you just a few things before we, we close because I have a lot of scriptures down there. 
you know that the devil is defeated. But who is going to do the enforcement? You. If you keep running, nobody is going to enforce it. Mm. You keep running, there will be no enforcement. He comes, he tries to take your children, he tries to, you pray and uh, all that, and uh, you're not taking a stand and rebuking him and standing and standing on the word of God and resisting him and letting him know that you know, you know his plans and you have a better plan and the power to overtake that plan. It will not happen. It will not happen. So many of us have been, we've been in places we're not supposed to be spiritually, physically. He's messing with our lives so much. Is depriving us of the things that God really meant for us to be. Let me show you, Sister Terry, go to Ephesians 6. Go to Ephesians 6. Let's look at a few things in Ephesians 6. The things you already know. But the Lord wants me to point some things out to us tonight. Ephesians 6. Which verse? Yeah, let's start from verse 10. And I want everybody to pay attention. Verse 10. Go on. Finally, my brethren. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Mm -hmm. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Okay, stop it there. Okay. Stop it there. Does everybody see that? Finally, might be strong in the Lord and in the power of what? His might. His might. Not the power of your might. You know, I hate it when preachers preach, have faith in your faith. That's baloney. How can you have faith in your, you are just, you are a clay. You are clay. You can't have faith in the clay. Have faith in your... No. No. The faith should be in the Lord. Not in you. Not, not, in, your, not in your abilities. Be strong in the Lord. And in this power of what? His might. Yes. Do you know what the might of God is? Do you know? The, the, even the power of the Holy Spirit is more powerful than dynamite. More powerful. That's why it's called dynamite. More powerful than dynamite. If you're strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, okay, look at verse uh, 10, 11. It says, put on what? The whole armor of what? God. Why? That you may be able to do what? Stand. Everybody says stand. stand. I, I, I know you are muted. But it says that you may be able to do what? Stand against the wives of the... He doesn't say you may be able to fall on your face. He doesn't say you may be able to get this. You may be able to stand. What does the Bible say? Shaman stood his ground. See that? Shaman stood and the Lord wrought a great victory. You got to stand. Stand. Take a stand. That means your mind is made up. Even before you go into that battle because Jesus has already fought it. You stand with the word of God. You refuse. You refuse. There will be elements trying to push you down. You keep standing. Sister Terry, read the uh, verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against <laughs> spiritual wickedness in high places. Boom. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. You see that? Stop there. You see that? Look at verse, verse, uh, verse 11. Say, put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand. Verse 13 says, also, put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to do what again? To stand. stand. You see the word stand? Stand. God is not the one making you to fall, tripping you. Yeah, you look at some television program when I used to watch Christian TV. I don't do anymore because of foolishness. And they said, hey, oh, I'm up. I'm putting the armor this morning. Every morning I wake up, I put my armor. I said, how dumb can you be and breed? Why take the armor off at night? That's where the battle is the greatest. It's at night when you're sleeping. You're supposed to go to bed with the ammo. You're supposed to wake up with the ammo. You're not supposed to put it off and go to bed and put it on every morning. You're not supposed to do that. Look at verse 13. That says, Wherefore, take unto the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand. 
in the evil day and haven't done all he says again to do what? Stand. Damn. I'm speaking to someone tonight. You got to stand. You've been lying down so much. You've been taking a beating so much. We can all see the scars in our lives from the attacks of the enemy. Oh, we have been beaten so much that it's becoming normal to accept it as a normal lifestyle. That was what all the people that fled did, but there was one man, a minority, just like the minority report when they went to spy Jericho. One minority. I can't imagine Shama trying to convince them to, to, to stand. They took off, but he stood. What happened? Because he stood, the Lord wrote a great victory. Look at Sister Terry, verse 14. Read the first verse of verse 14. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Okay. You see how he started it again? Stand therefore. Stand. That's a mark of a hero. That's a mark of a conqueror. That's a mark of someone who has stepped out by faith, who knows his God. The Bible said that they that know their God shall do exploits. God has marked you for exploit. You are a candidate for supernatural miracle. Tonight, it's enough. You've had enough. I have had enough. Mm -hmm. If you give him one inch, he's going to go 100 yards. It's enough. But what do we have to do? Take the counsel of God. Put on the whole armor of God. I don't have time. That's that's a time. Uh, that's a study for another time to discuss each armor. Study the word of God. Take the sword of the spirit. And anything you read that is contrary to the word of God is of the devil. Directly or indirectly. Reject it. And if God says so, stand on that word. No matter how you are pushed, no matter how wind is blowing, stand on that word. Declare your victory. Declare your freedom. In the name of Jesus. We got to do that. It's very important. Taking the word of God, build a reservoir of the word in your spirit so that when you need it, it will come up. It will come up. Listen, folks. We, <laughs> when we leave this word, we are going straight to heaven. We know that by the word of God. All these victories and challenges, finances, and we don't need all those things in heaven. But God wants you and I to live victoriously here. Why? Because others will see his hand and they want to serve him. That's, that's the key. And remember the Bible says, when he saves us, he can take us home. But he doesn't want to do that. Because he wants us to be a witness for him here. We are going through rehearsal for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. You have power. You have dominion. I don't even think that Shama was a big guy. I don't know. But the, the thing that he stood, his standing was not because he had faith in himself or in his abilities. He had faith and confidence in the word of God, in the relationship and the promises that God has given. This happened in the Old Testament. Can you imagine now that we have a better covenant built on better promises. I'm going to show you one more thing, then we're going to pray. So I tell you, I want you to go to, to uh, 2 Samuel, chapter, chapters, I think chapter 17, uh, 2 Samuel 17, or actually 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel okay. 17. First Samuel 17. Okay. I want I want you to read 45. Yes, read 45. Okay. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword, and with the spear, and with the shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defiled. Okay. This okay. day. Yeah, go on, go on, finish. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee, and take thine head from thee, 
and I will give the caucus of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beast of the earth, okay. that all the earth may know that there is a God in you Israel. See you see the reason? Amen. You see the reason why? Many a time we look at the David and Goliath story, we talk about, oh, the slingshot. That's, that was not where the power was. David never thought about, if I hit you with this slingshot, you wouldn't know your name again, even though that's what he did. That was not where the power was. Sister, tell you, read verse 45 again. Everybody listen to what David told him, where the power was. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel. Okay, that's it. That? No, that's it. You see that? We miss that. We miss that. We all were fascinated by David as more rocks uh, for Goliath's brother. All those things were true. But the main thing was where the power was. Some, Saul gave him carnal weapon. David could not find spiritual battle with carnal weapon. He put the color weapon. He said, "No, this, this, this is not." He hadn't proved it. Yeah, he has not proved that weapon. Saul had not either. Otherwise, he would have gone after Goliath. <laughs> Saul had no confidence in that weapon himself. That was he was terrified for forty days. David pointed to where the power was. You come against mm -hmm. me with all this and that, but hey, in the name of my Lord, the God of the host of Israel. What is the equivalent for us tonight? The name of Jesus. Yes. That's the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. You can say in the name of Jesus, I take dominion over you, devil. In the name of Jesus, you cannot kill my son before his time. In the name of Jesus, you will not destroy this marriage. In the name of Jesus, you will not take my promotion from me. In the name of Jesus, you can't intimidate me. I am the righteousness Amen. of God in Christ Jesus. For God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of things present, of things yet to come. And every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Somebody shout hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. We gotta we gotta be aggressive. The kingdom suffered violently, <laughs> violently. I remember years ago I've told this story over out of my ten testimonies to the glory when our son was lying motionless. Medical College of Virginia. He was clinically dead, clinically dead, clinically dead. When all this People were telling me, God needs a boy in heaven. I said, no, he doesn't. He has a lot of angels and people worshiping him. I need my boy here. He was eight years old. And then we knew what the devil was doing. He was the one trying to steal our son with the spirit of death. We stood together, my wife and I, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Ike, you're not dying before your time. Ike, you got to get up. Get up from that hospital bed. The guy was clinical dead and get up from that hospital bed in the name of Jesus. Get up. Get up. Get up in Jesus' name. We're not going to let him kill you before your time. In the name of Jesus, you have not fulfilled your destiny. In Jesus, We have dominion. We command you, spirit of death. Leave him. Rise up. 30 minutes later, I was driving. Glory to God. College campus. He said, sir, the doctor, the medical college of Virginia has an urgent message. It's very urgent, he said. That time there were no cell phones. I called the doctor, said, sir, I don't know what happened. Your boy was clinically dead. There was nothing we could do for him. But he said about 15 minutes ago, the young man took away everything, all the drifts, everything connected to him. He's walking around. He said, I want to go home. I want my mama. I want my daddy. I want to go home. That boy is in his late thirties today. Somebody shout hallelujah. Because yes, Lord. Took hallelujah. our ground and took dominion over the enemy. That's You must do that tonight. You. you must do that tonight. Whether it's in your job, in your finances, if it's finances, you know the law that God has established. You begin to give tithes and offering and begin to remind them of your faithfulness. Whatever it is tonight, the children, they've said, oh, it's not going to happen. No, no. There is no limit to what he can do. David proved it. A young teenager took an entire giant standing on his word of his God and the might. 
the might of his God. Yes. And the people would know. And when God does it, people will know that there's a God that you worship and the mm -hmm. God that you serve. And when they come, they're going to serve. They're going to ask you what happened. You tell them, oh, this was what happened. I didn't put faith in anybody or in the preacher. I put it in God. And I stood. Oh, Richard God. And somebody shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. Tonight,